since uh, May did such a fantastic job of introducing me, I'll just introduce uh, the firm that I work for that I'm representing here today. So McKinsey, you may, you may all know McKinsey as a strategy consultant, one of the leading strategy consultants in the world. Um, what you may perhaps not know is that most of her work is in the area of operations. I belong to a practice known as a capital projects and infrastructure practice, where our focus is entirely on helping our clients execute the capital projects more effectively. So we spend a lot of time thinking about construction and projects, which is where we uh, came across the, the, the modular. We have been very interested in modular. As Mary mentioned, our recent report covers modular in detail. So uh, we've been ranked consistently number one in capital projects advisory by an independent rating agency. But what I really wanted to mention here was that we spend, we invest a lot of time and money in thought leadership and research. And then we produce all these great reports which we just give away. So our reports are actually available <laughs> to everyone. And at the end of this presentation, I'll have um, my contact details and you'll see the McKinsey website on it. You can go up there and download all the reports you want and it covers everything <laughs> that you could possibly think of, um, some, of some of which I have shown on this page but there are a ton more that you, can, that you can access. I still don't understand this business model, but <laughs> McKinsey seems to believe in it. All right, my presentation today is in three parts. Uh, since we are, we, are, we are a consulting firm, you kind of expect us to look at the big picture. So I'm gonna start with talking about some macroeconomic trends. What are some global things that are happening that could impact our industry? And what specifically does it have to do with modular? And then I'll talk about the modular report that we published that Mary mentioned. And finally, I want to set the stage for all the discussions that you're going to have today in all the breakout rooms. So tee up Minnesota, some of the things that Stephanie mentioned, and how modular can play a part. Macroeconomic trends. There are at least three that I want to mention. One is there's, uh, there's something happening globally that's very interesting. There is an urbanization phenomenon happening, which means that people are moving to cities more and more. People want to live in cities. This may seem obvious. We, we did it. In the US, we are almost completely urbanized. But this is happening at a very fast rate globally. China, for example, is creating something like seven Chicago's every year, the equivalent of seven, seven of them every year, people moving to, to cities. What this does is it's generally very good. Cities are more efficient in many ways than, um, than rural living, but it creates a huge demand for housing, and not just housing. People want a number of things today that you had to provide them. These are all quality of life type issues, transportation, technology, green spaces, all these things have to be provided, but housing is fundamental. Stephanie mentioned that. What does this have to do with us in the US? This is a global phenomenon happening in emerging markets. What's happening in the US is cities are competing with each other. Again, Stephanie made reference to it. If we are a Midwestern city, and we are competing with other Midwestern cities and with the coast, where they have other advantages, we have to have affordable housing in order to be able to compete, attract businesses and talent to our cities. Next phenomenon that I should mention is infrastructure. Or I should say lack of infrastructure. We've been talking about infrastructure forever. We talk about infrastructure all the time. It comes up at every political cycle, election cycle, right? But nothing gets done. The, the thing is, we have to do something about it because infrastructure, infrastructure in the US and globally, as a matter of fact, is starting to fall apart. And this is extremely dangerous. So we have to address it. The reason I'm mentioning it here is because of two reasons. One is some of the infrastructure issues can be addressed by modular. But much more important than that, remember that shrinking pool of labor that Jason mentioned? Infrastructure is competing with us for the same shrinking pool of labor. So you, you can either build houses or we can address infrastructure. And if infrastructure gets going, guess where all that labor is going to be taken up? They're all going to be doing that work. Who's going to build the houses? And then the third phenomenon I want to mention is sustainability. This is becoming more and more important. Give you um, 
uh, some information. We all know that transportation as an industry is a big contributor to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we all know cars emit. Um, it's estimated that transportation accounts for something like 33% of greenhouse gas emissions. Do you know what buildings contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? 47%. So we are a bigger contributor. Buildings as a whole, if you take into account all the materials that go into buildings, and the fact that buildings need to be heated and cooled and all this kind of stuff, the, green, the carbon footprint of buildings is even more significant than all the transportation industry put together. So anything we can do in the area of sustainability, reducing energy usage, more efficient energy usage, benefits us all. So you know, addressing our building needs with sustainability on the base of sustainability is an extremely important initiative. What materials do you choose? How do you design for green buildings? One more factor. In addition to sustainability, resilience. We are going to be experiencing more and more extreme weather events. We saw that. I mean, when, when Dorian made landfall, it was rated as one of the strongest storms in the Atlantic uh, uh, hurricane season. Storms are getting stronger, and our buildings will have to withstand those extreme weather events. So there has been some research done that proves that modular construction is actually stronger because of the quality of modular construction is stronger already compared to traditional construction. Um, Hurricane Andrew, 1992, uh, hit Florida. FEMA did some analysis. After that, they have actually published the results of it, saying modular buildings withstood that better than uh, traditional buildings. In Japan, modular buildings are a premium product. People are willing to pay extra for modular construction. Why? Because they perform better in earthquakes. So by design, Without any additional codes or regulations, modular is better in, uh, from, a, from a resilience perspective. Just imagine, as extreme weather becomes more common and regulations and codes get tightened up for our buildings, if that happens, we can address that much more easily with modular than uh, with traditional construction. So jumping into what we said in our, in our um, uh, modular report, this has already been covered, but I'll touch on this uh, briefly. There are two converging phenomena that is causing, that's making us attend conferences like these and talk about modular uh, construction. One is this is shortage of housing. This is everywhere. This is global, in fact, but particularly acute in certain cities. And uh, Stephanie mentioned how short we are in, uh, in, in our own state. Um, at the same time that we have the shortage, we also have a very high cost of uh, construction labor. Jason mentioned that. We are, people in the construction industry are aging out. There are not enough people coming into that industry to, uh, to, carry, to, provide that, uh, to provide that support. So those two converging phenomena are going to drive us towards modular, whether we like it or not. We have to look at alternative ways of building, uh, building our buildings. We still haven't conquered the productivity issue that one of the McKinsey previous reports highlighted in the construction industry. Technology is coming in, improved processes, but we're still not there. Despite all of these, modular is a very small percentage of the total construction starts in this country. We are less than 5%, so we have enormous room to grow. If we do, if we do adopt modular construction, here are some of the benefits. You can cut the time by half. Jason mentioned some of the things that you should look out for. You have to start early. You have to standardize. But reducing the total schedule by half, by 50%, is achievable. It's been done. People are doing it. The cost savings are there. You can even achieve up to 40% cost savings. 20% is definitely possible. But people are struggling with it, to be very honest. Uh, one of the reasons is many of the modular manufacturers in this country today are really quite small. We don't have the scale yet to achieve the kind of cost savings that, that can be realized, but the potential is there. I already mentioned this. The quality of the end product is amazing uh, compared to what can be done on site. The control conditions that you have in a, in a factory environment leads to better quality, which in turn helps us achieve those sustainability objectives and the resilience objectives that I mentioned before. 
Linbex is a Swedish company, and uh, they've been doing timber-based uh, modular um, multi-unit, multi-family housing forever. Uh, really, really interesting company. The, uh, one of the sustainability things that I should mention um, is this. Sustainability is much more than just energy, right? We want uh, pay equity, we want gender equity. There are so many things that sustainability covers. If you take the construction industry and you look at the participation of women in the construction workforce out in the field, is 3.5%. 3.5% of the construction workforce is women. It, the total is about 10%, but the ones that work in the field is only about 3.5%. You know, we keep talking about this lack of um, uh, labor shortage and lack of people. Half the population, we don't make them feel welcome in construction. So what, you know, there, there's hardly anybody there. If you take that and move it to a factory in a standard manufacturing environment, female participation is about 29%. All of a sudden, you went from 35 to 29%. Lindbergs in Sweden has 45% female in their workforce. So see what, what can be, all of a sudden, we're talking about a labor shortage, and then we open up the possibility of half the population being able to take part in addressing that problem. So that is why we should go modular. But what is modular? Uh, there, are, there are essentially... Uh, two different directions you can go. If you're someone who wants to go and start a factory tomorrow to make modular units, you can go one of two ways. You can make what, what are known as 2D or panelized constructions. Essentially, you, you're, you're creating walls, floors, ceilings as separate units. You can load them in a standard, standard container and ship them off wherever you want. It's fairly easy. It folds down. It's, and then on site, you assemble them together. You can include all the conduits and ducts that are needed for HVAC, electrical, plumbing, everything inside the panels. So this is a very efficient way, of, a far more efficient way of building than our traditional site construction. The panels arrive on site, and they're very flexible as well because you can build to suit different configurations. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to build complete units. 3D volumetric units, which means that you're building entire rooms, and this is along the lines of what Jason was talking about, for a hotel, for multi-unit housing, for dormitories. These have lend themselves very, very well for 3D volumetric. So if you're a model manufacturer, you're, decide, you're strategically you're making a choice, and there are people here in this audience from different manufacturers who have gone in those two different directions. Katera, who you'll be hearing from, has gone in the panelized direction. Skender, and others um, we, we have here have gone in the volumetric direction. If you have a chance, you should talk to these people and ask them why they decided to adopt that strategy. It's very, it's very interesting, and this is a key decision you'd have to make as a modeling manufacturer. Volumetric is the most efficient in a way because it takes the most labor off on-site and moves it off-site. Panelized has the most flexibility. It can accommodate almost any kind of uh, construction. So each one has its advantages. We've done some analysis on a four-story multifamily housing. We did a comparison between the two. And cost savings using panelized was about 17%. Um, cost savings using a hybrid model of combined 3D and panelized was about 20%. And full 3D volumetric was about 24%. So 3D volumetric gave us the most cost savings, but that is not true of all situations. It really depends on the project. And like I said, you cannot use 3D volumetric in, for certain projects. So panelized gives you advantages there. Brief history of modular. Modular has been f- around forever. Uh, I think this has also been mentioned. But it's gone up and down. It's fallen out of favor, come back in fashion, and then again, there'll be some kind of a problem, and then it disappeared again. In the UK, they had a, they had actually, in London, they had a, a modular apartment tower collapse in the late 60s, 68 or something, which, you know, completely killed the modular industry, 
uh, in, in the UK and, and Europe pretty much. Um, in the US, we had manufactured homes for a long time. Jason mentioned it. But for some reason, they became associated with cheap, po potentially lower quality type construction. That gave the industry a bad name. Modular of today is completely different. And as I said, it's high quality. It's, it's even premium quality. And we are finally making the transition in mindset from what we, from the manufactured home uh, era to the new modular era. There are seven factors that determine whether modular is appropriate for where you are, for any given locality. Of these seven, there are two that are the most important. One is the labor dynamics, which I already mentioned. If you're short of labor, and if your labor is expensive, modular is the answer. The other thing is demand. If I'm going to invest, I don't know, 40 to $100 million in starting a modular factory, I need a pipeline of work. I need a constant pipeline of work. This is not like doing on-site construction where I build and then I shut down and I move and do it somewhere else. If I invest in a factory, I've got to have demand coming in all the time. If you can provide the demand, if Minnesota can give me work to keep my factory full for a predictable duration, I'll build a factory. There's been a little bit of this um, you know, um, chicken and egg thing in the industry, and one of the reasons why people haven't jumped in, why we don't have more modular supply, is because the modular manufacturers are saying, well, okay, I'll build it, but I have to invest all this money. Are you going to give me the work? And then people are saying, well, you proved to me that modular is really great, and then I'll give you the work. Somebody, you know, this is why we have these conferences. We're getting all the right people together. We have to give the manufacturers the confidence to go and invest and build. And we need the investors who are behind the manufacturers giving them money to say, yes, invest in that because it's a really good investment. It's going to pay off. So a little bit of detail. I said you can save 50% of the time doing a modular construction. How can you do that? And Jason kind of stole my thunder on this a little bit. But uh, you have to start early. You have to standardize your design. It's critical. But here's why. Modular really is much faster. If you look at traditional construction, on-site construction, it's basically sequential. You come and prepare the site, you do your foundations, your design is being done, and then you start building. Everything happens sequentially. Modular changes that model. Yes, foundations are being done on the field, but while the foundations are being done, you're already manufacturing your units. Your design is done, send it to the factory, start manufacturing. So things are happening in parallel. If you really standardize, you can save half the time. Just imagine the benefits of that. You don't have to be out in the field, mobilize, have all those overheads for, for a year. You can do it in a matter of weeks, is all you have to be in the field. Imagine the cost savings. You have no weather delays. That's not going to impact your schedule at all. I mean, you have limited weather exposure because when you're putting the stuff up in the field, you can still be affected by weather. But most of it you've taken out of the picture. Materials. So let me talk about, OK, so that's, that's scheduled. So you can save half the time. How about the cost? There are two areas that you should really focus If you're a model manufacturer, the two areas that you should really focus on to get your costs down. A number of areas, but two are extremely important. One is, of course, the labor productivity part. The, ver the whole reason you're moving from the site to the factory is because they improve productivity. So can you automate? Can you use robots? How much labor can you save? How much faster can you do? That's important on the labor side. And on the material side, you really have to look at your supply chain and see how much, you can, you can, how much money you can save by consolidating your purchases. <coughs> so those are two primary factors. But there are a number of other things that also the investment in the factory itself adds to the cost of modular, where you're taking away costs from labor and material. There are things that, that do add. Logistics will add to the cost, because now you have to ship your units to the field. So those work against you. But despite that, 20% is definitely achievable. 
So modular is so great. Modular saves time. Modular saves money. Is everybody in the world doing it? Unfortunately not. So I mentioned already the factors that drive modularization. The Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, and so on, have been very strong users of modular because they have very short building seasons. They have long winters, gets dark very, very early. They have a lot of timber. They sound a little bit like Minnesota. <laughs> so they have been using modular forever. 40% uh, look at that. 45% of the total construction in the Nordics is modular. Look at us. 3%. Now, just imagine if we can get to 20%, half of what the Nordics are doing, and we achieve the 20% cost savings that we are talking about. And let's say we have 225, I think, billion dollars. Construction starts in 2017, if I remember right. So you do the math. How many billions of dollars of savings are we talking about? I think it's in the billions of dollars. I do. <laughs> it's a lot of money. I think it's like $8 billion or something, right? Who is going to benefit? Who? $8 billion out there, just in the US, right? Where's that going to go? Who's going to benefit from this? Are there winners and losers? Yes, there are winners and losers. And yes, some people are going to benefit. If you take the value chain, everybody from the investors, developers, owners, um, modular manufacturers, general contractors, um, the autodesks of the world, the ones who provide engineering service, all, all of them, you take them all out, lay them uh, across as a value chain and look at the effect of modular on all of them. It's not equal. Not everybody benefits. Owners and developers are going to benefit because they can make more, more, uh, more profits. Um, the ones who are going to be squeezed are the general contractors. If you're a general contractor you, and you see modular coming, you, re you have to think about your strategy. Are you going to join the modular manufacturer and become a modular manufacturer like Skander did? Or are you going to do something else because the volume of your business is going to shrink? We did, um, the Modular Building Institute is an industry organization that collects a lot of data. Look at, this is just to illustrate how low modularization is today in, um, uh, in the US. And even a 1% change can be a tremendous increase in the revenues uh, to this industry. But here's what I, what I wanted to close on. If you look at the country as a whole, and look at the various regions, we kind of mapped how many modular units are being built in each area, and where are they being built with this multifamily education. If you look at those different regions, you know, as you would expect, California had a, a lot of units. Florida had a lot of units. Minnesota is part of this Midwest region that's kind of in the middle uh, in terms of number of units uh, uh, produced in modular. We produced less than 3,500 units in 2018, modular, modular units. That's everything. That's schools, jails, uh, prisons, um, offices, multi multifamily housing, everything. What we need is close to 35,000 units. And those are using Stephanie's numbers. That she mentioned that 52,000 units that we are short of, plus the demand every year is roughly 10,000 units. So if you look at it over the course of next 10 years, we need 35,000 units of housing. Just purely from a modular perspective, we're producing a tenth of that. Why can't we do half of that with modular? We'll save money, we'll save time, maybe more than half. That is the message that the modular manufacturers need to hear. And that's the purpose of, of gatherings like this one. What I really like about the fact that, uh, about this conference is that we have an action planning session in the afternoon. That's very unusual for a conference. I attend many conferences, never heard of an action planning session. I really have to hand it to you guys that, that you know, I think that's going to be very valuable. So I'll leave you with that thought. Modular can really, really help Minnesota with your housing strategy issue. 
but it's up to all of us to, to jump in and um, make that a reality. Thank you.